The Great Fire of 1666 so imprinted itself on the history of London as to obliterate memories of every other fire. It was the defining moment in the life of the city. Samuel Pepys recorded its progress. We went to a little alehouse on the bank side, over against the Three Cranes, and there stayed till it was dark almost and saw the fire grow. And as it grew darker, appeared more and more, and in corners and upon steeples between churches and houses, as far as we could see up the hill of the city, in a most horrid, malicious, bloody flame, not like the fine flame of an ordinary fire. A friend of Pepys, the writer and scholar John Evelyn, walked the streets all night as the fire spread. The conflagration was so universal and the people so astonished that from the beginning, I know not by what desponding or fate, they hardly stirred to quench it. There was nothing heard or seen but crying out and lamentation and running about like distracted creatures. Such a strange consternation there was upon them. This was where the Great Fire started. It was one of the most terrible conflagrations in urban history, but its cause still remains mysterious. It's as if some ancient spirit of fire had reared its head in the heart of the city. Everybody endeavouring to remove their goods and flinging them into the river. Poor people staying in their houses as long as till the very fire touched them, then running into boats or clambering from one pair of stairs by the waterside to another. The smoke stretched for 50 miles so that those fleeing from the fire traveled for hours in its shadow. Those who took to the river for safety were rained upon by flying cinders and ash. That night there were fires all over the city. They spread south to the Thames and east along Cornhill and Gracechurch Street. Four fires united into one huge flame on the corner of Threadneedle Street and Cheapside. It raged so far west that it took hold of the original St. Paul's Cathedral. The stones of St. Paul's flew like grenades, the lead melting down the streets in a stream, the very pavements glowing with a fiery redness. Nor horse nor man was able to tread on them. The citizens of London were bewildered. Many fled into the surrounding fields of Islington, Finsbury and Highgate, where they watched and wept. Like Londoners all over the city, Samuel Pepys reluctantly prepared to leave his home and possessions. We did carry much of my goods into the garden, by moonshine, it being brave, dry and warm weather. And Mr. Hayter and I did remove my money and iron chests into my cellar was thinking that the safest place and got my bags of gold into my office ready to carry away and in the evening Sir W Penn and I did dig a pit in the garden and put our wine in it and I my parmesan cheese as well the eastern wind was still more impetuously driving the flames forwards nothing but the almighty power of God was able to stop them for vain was the help of man. Thus I left it, burning, a resemblance of Sodom or the last day, the ruins resembling a picture of Troy. London was no more. There were many representations of those five days of fire. The Great Fire of London was the most arresting image of the 17th century. 
When London burns, its inhabitants are strangely drawn to the flames. Fire has always been conceived in theatrical terms. It is perhaps appropriate that London's theatres continually go up in flames. 37 were destroyed between 1789 and 1919. The Great Fire of London itself was recreated as a fireworks display for enthusiastic crowds in the grounds of a South London music hall in 1845. The building later fell victim to London's curse and was itself burned to the ground. When the House of Commons was destroyed by fire in 1834, Turner was inspired to paint some of his most beautiful images, as though he recognised that in the heart of the flame he might also evoke the spirit of the city itself. Virginia Woolf saw that spirit in the fiery glow of the city's lights. There were the lights of the great theatres, the lights of the long streets, Lights which indicated huge squares of domestic comfort. No darkness would ever settle upon those lamps, just as no darkness had settled on them for hundreds of years. It seemed dreadful that the town should blaze forever in the same spot, eternally burnt, eternally scarred. London's fire would touch Virginia Woolf's own life soon enough. On the 7th of September 1940, 600 German bombers marshalled in great waves dropped their explosive and high incendiary devices over the city. Half a mile of the Thames shore burned. Telegraph poles began to smoke, then ignite from base to crown. In the crypt of a church in Bow, people were kneeling and crying and praying. The German bombers came back the next night and then the next. The east of London was raised to the ground. In the first 30 days, 6,000 people were killed. It was compared to the end of the world and to hell. To Londoners, it seemed to be a war against London itself. To see London all blasted, that too raked my heart. When I see a great smash, like a crushed matchbox where an old house stood, I wave my hand to London. The city became misshapen and confused. The bombing was a challenge to Londoners' habitual indifference to each other. In a city where people seem not to care about the living, did they still have the right to mourn the dead? Who lived there? I suppose the casual young men and women I used to see from my window. The flat dwellers who used to have flower pots and sit in the balcony. All now blown to bits. The barriers of anonymity and indifference began to break down. So strangers would say, good night, good luck, as they passed each other in the street. A house about 30 yards from ours struck at one this morning by a bomb, completely ruined. Scraps of cloth hanging to the bare walls at the side still standing. A looking glass, I think, swinging. Like a tooth knocked out. A clean cut. Virginia Woolf registers the sensation of physical shock 
as if the city were a living being that could suffer hurt. <laughs> 